how they were developed, and what they have accomplished. Um, specific presentations and examples are going to include the Schinberg Center's lost property inventory and their affordable housing suitability model, uh, the Furman Center's subsidized housing information project, and Denver's work documenting and mapping their affordable housing inventory near transit. Um, our presenters are going to present in, um, in rounds. We're going to have three rounds so that we're not listening to any one person for too long. Round one for each, each of the models is going to address the basic goals and structure of each model. Um, at, at the end of each of the three presentations in round one, if, if anyone has any specific questions related to those basic goals or structure, um, feel free to ask them at that point and we'll address them then. If it's a larger question, um, hold off until uh, round two or round three. Uh, round two, each, each, um, each presenter will discuss what has been accomplished and, and some examples from examples of their database in use. And then um, there's the, there are the rounds. And then round uh, three, we will discuss the applicability and adaptability of each model. Um, our goal is to end with plenty of time um, for questions and comments and discussion from, um, from everyone that's, that's on the call and, and uh, watching the, um, the audio. So, um, so with that being said, we're going to begin round one um, with Ann Ray from the Schimberg Center at University of Florida. Um, and as she is presenting, um, if you have a question or a comment, you can submit it, like I said, via the chat on the left-hand side, or better yet, raise your hand, and, um, and I can, I can uh, call on you so you can vocalize your, your own questions. So um, with that, Ann, it's all yours. Thanks, Tracy. Um, as Tracy said, I'm with the Schimberg Center for Housing Studies at University of Florida. And we're part of one of these MacArthur state and local partnerships um, with Florida Housing Finance Corporation and Florida Housing Coalition to support the preservation of assisted rental housing in the state. And um, one database that I think I've talked with many of you in the past about is our assisted housing inventory. Um, since 2004, we've had on the web a property level inventory of all the um, housing properties in Florida that affordable rental housing properties that are subsidized by HUD, by USDA Rural Development, by Florida Housing Finance Corporation, and by our local housing finance authorities. It's about 2,300 properties and about 254,000 affordable housing units. And with those, we provide information at the property level about the subsidies that are in the property, um, when those subsidies expire, what their location is, target population, information about the ownership. And we do that both to understand what affordable housing supply exists in Florida, but also what's at risk. And we've worked on risk assessment methods to find properties that are either at risk of converting to market rate housing or at risk through deterioration or because um, their subsidies are expiring. Because we talked about that a lot, I'd like to actually turn to a couple complementary data sets that we've put together since we've been doing this research to support preservation and to talk about some of the practice and the research that's starting to grow out of them. I'm going to spend the bulk of the time talking about our lost properties inventory. And this is really a mirror image of the assisted housing inventory I just mentioned. It's the same kind of data, but rather than being for, for properties that are currently subsidized that have rent and income restrictions, these are properties that we've lost to the assisted housing inventory for the reasons I mentioned before, because of expiring subsidies, because of um, deterioration. It's about 450 properties and about roughly 42,000 units. So they previously had rent and income restrictions and no longer did. We've been we have these tracked back to properties that we've lost since 1993. Um, and in addition to compiling this database, we're also doing an annual survey of these properties to find out what's happened once they're no longer subsidized housing. Um, are they still rental? Have they been demolished? Have they converted to condos? And of those that have remained rental housing, uh, what are the rents? The way we put this inventory together, um, it's actually, since we've started doing this assisted housing inventory year over year, it's gotten easier. The first thing we do is we look at all the properties that drop out of our assisted housing inventory each year as we update it. So if we see a property 
that was in the inventory the previous year, and then we get data feeds from HUD, from RD, from our State Housing Finance Authority, and we see that that property is no longer on the list, we check and see whether that's been lost to the subsidized inventory. And then we've also gone backwards historically and gotten lists of inactive properties um, from our HFA, from RD, um, a list looking at HUD's terminated mortgage database. And we also got a few years back from FHA a spreadsheet of um, properties that formerly had Section 8 contracts that had opted out of those contracts. I, that's actually a national list, and I'd be happy to share that with other folks if they're interested in coming up with a similar inventory on their own. We do this for a couple reasons. One is so that we can understand what supply that we've lost. Um, there's an advocacy aspect to this, that the 42,000 unit affordable unit number means something. We're able to pinpoint this to specific geographic areas. We see, for instance, that these are heavily concentrated in the state's large metro areas. And so it's a way of talking about, in concrete terms, I, I, I guess the stakes of the preservation debate. What happens when assisted housing is not preserved? Um, we're also looking at the characteristics of these properties to refine our risk assessment tools. It's one thing to look at what we think um, indicates risk. It's another thing to look historically at the properties we've actually lost and see the, whether they fit the risk profiles that, we, that we've put together. And I, I think we have, I'll talk about this a little bit, I think we have seen a few surprises there. And finally, before I get into some of what we learned from it, this is all publicly accessible on the Schimberg Center's website. Um, you can search by county and get a list of the properties. And there's kind of a, what I'm sure looks like a pretty tiny screenshot of what some of the results might look like if you search for a particular county. Um, I want to talk very briefly about some of the things that we've learned about from the lost properties inventory. And Andres Blanco is going to talk about some more specific research results. But just to get a sense of what's in this, what, what makes up this 450 or so properties. One thing we found is that, looking back to 1993, that the losses really take off in the early 2000s. And that's when um, the early tax credit properties and early mortgage revenue bond properties start to hit their subsidy expiration dates. Um, so suddenly, in the early 2000s, we start to lose large numbers of units. Um, that's continued, actually, because, um, because first because of the condo conversion wave, and then because of, um, and now we're starting to see more and more foreclosures. We've also found, as I said before, that most of the properties that we've lost in Florida, most of the units have been tax credit or mortgage revenue bond properties. Although about one in six of the units that we've lost had some kind of project-based rental assistance, either from HUD or RD. Um, but really, this mirrors the state's inventory. Most of the, most of the units we have in the state they really are dominated by Florida Housing Finance Corporation's inventory of tax credit and bond finance units. And so that's most of what we've lost. This gives, I think, an example of what I've talked about, about the advocacy value of having a lost properties inventory. The blue lines show the units that we've added each of these years in the past few years. And the red lines show the, the units that we've lost that we're tracking through the LPI. And so the, what the LPI has shown us is that we're sort of taking two steps forward and one step back. And in the case of the past couple of years, even, with, even bro breaking around even, at least in 2008 and 2009, or even in some years, losing more, more units than we're adding. And so what the LPI, what having a lost properties inventory as a mirror to our assisted housing inventory does, it shows us the net gain of units. Yes, we're gaining units, but we're doing it much more slowly than we would if we weren't losing properties along the way and continuing to, to lose them, especially recently because of multi-family multi foreclosures. And in fact, almost all of the units that we've lost in the past couple of years have something to do with, foreclo um, with the foreclosure distressed property. Now I want to talk briefly about what we're finding in this survey, and you'll hear more about that a little bit later. Um, and for the past three years now, we've surveyed the properties, and we've reached about half of, we've gotten information of about half of those 450 properties, and the numbers you see on your screen refer to those half. Um, what we found is most of these properties are continuing to operate as rental housing. There is a, um, there is a certain number of them that are condos, and then a smaller number that have been um, demolished or vacant. But again, these numbers refer to our survey sample, not the whole, not the whole inventory. Um, 
When we, felt, when we looked at rents, what we found is that most of these are, quote, affordable, but not at the lowest levels of affordability, even if they used to be um, project-based Section 8, say. Um, about half of these units are serving tenants at 60% AMI or a little bit lower. Almost all of the other ones are, are serving, the, the rents are affordable at 60 to 80% of AMI. Um, so they're affordable, but not at the lowest level. What we found is that none of these properties um, provide affordable units for extremely low-income tenants. None of them have affordability at 30% AMI or lower. So one thing the LPI does is, is put some concrete numbers around showing the value of preserving in this sort of sea of potential assisted housing properties that could be preserved, preserving the project-based units, because there's simply nothing else on the market once those, once those subsidies are, are gone that are going to show a similar, um, they're going to provide similar affordability. So that's an Im introduction to the lost properties inventory. We're starting to use this, as I said, to reassess our risk assessment methods and understand, I think, some of the nuances of preservation. One is that um, while our risk assessment methods had really emphasized the potential loss of for-profit owned properties through conversion to market rate, we're finding that for-profit owned properties dominate this um, lost properties inventory, but they dominate the state's assisted inventory in general. And we have lost several nonprofit owned properties. Uh, we've tried to do some more anecdotal follow-up with them, and in some cases we're losing them because, um, uh, because of deterioration, but in others we're losing them for the same motivation that for-profit owners have, because the owners want to do something else with their time and their money, um, because they're having trouble dealing with the regulatory agencies. So again, having this lost properties inventory and, and looking more intensively into what we're losing now, I think really gives us a sense of some of the nuance involved in preservation. I want to speak very briefly a minute or two about our assisted housing, uh, I'm sorry, affordable housing suitability model, which is a separate database that we've been developing. This is a little different. This is something that helps us look at the location of assisted housing and of affordable housing in general. Um, the affordable housing suitability model, or the AHS model, is a, GIS, is a GIS model that lets us look at the physical and social conditions um, to analyze the suitability of individual sites for affordable housing preservation or construction. And so we look at different goals. You see them listed on the screen, um, neighborhood characteristics, the physical characteristics of the site, which are subsumed into this residential suitability score, um, rental housing costs, driving, housing, uh, driving costs, and transit accessibility how these are linked, how they conflict, and it actually incorporates hun literally hundreds of variables that uh, add up to scores that let us see whether places are uh, better or worse places for assisted housing. Um, I just want to show very quickly, because I know we're running out of time, a couple maps that we've generated that with this, looking at our affordable, our assisted housing inventory in particular, and I know this is very hard to see on the screen, but um, this shows, I think, how some of our goals in preservation can conflict. In this case, the little dots that you see are the different, pro are different assisted housing properties by funder. And from red to green, red being the worst, green being the best, we've scored them on their transit accessibility. At the same time, using, these, using the same information, the flip side of that is to score them based on their, this neighborhood characteristic scores, really socioeconomic characteristics, measures of school quality, um, measures of crime, measures of area income and poverty. And what I think you can see is that they're really mirror images of each other. That there are assisted housing properties that exist in locations with both kinds of ratings, but what tends to be the red zone, the worst areas for transit accessibility, tend to be the best areas for opportunities for, for low crime, for high quality schools, and vice versa. So. We, I'd be happy to take questions about, about the AHS model. But this gives us some way to take our lost properties, our assisted properties, and our thoughts about new construction and begin to evaluate them in terms of both the opportunities and the trade-offs they present. So I'll turn things over now, and, and Andres Blanco from our faculty is going to talk some more about some of the more specific research findings he's had on what happened to the LPI properties after they left the inventory. Thanks a lot, Anne. That's great. Um, if anyone has any specific questions on um, on what Anne just presented, um, feel free to send them along now. Um, and we can also ask, we'll have plenty of time to ask more questions um, 
more questions later. I don't see any coming in. So we're going to um, move right on to um, Vincent Reyna from the Furman Center at NYU. And again, as he's speaking, feel free to um, submit questions or, or raise your hand and, and we'll get to you. So Vincent, I think you're, you have control. I don't hear Vincent. Um, so Vincent, I don't, um, we don't hear you on here, so we're going to um, skip over you for now while we get your phone um, fixed. And we're going to move down to, um, not down to, I'm sorry, we'll move over to um, Tom and Jenny at the um, Community Strategies Institute. Let me find the right slide here. Um, and let them go while we're working out um, Vincent's um, while we're working out uh, Vincent's technical problems. Jenny and Tom, I think that you should have control now. Thanks, Tracy. Can you Great. hear me? I can. Good. Okay. Um, I'm Jenny Rogers with the Community Strategies Institute, and I'm on with Tom Hart, also of the institute. Um, and we're going to talk about four data sets that we created for the City of Denver. Uh, this project was undertaken by the City Office of Economic Development, Business, and Housing Services in 2010, and it was paid for by the MacArthur Foundation and the City of Denver. Data sets were developed for use by the City and the Denver Transit-Oriented Development Fund and Fund Partners, which has now grown into a regional mile-high transit opportunity collaborative. As some background, um, Denver and the metro area is undergoing the nation's largest public transit expansion with the addition of five new light rail lines, and those are being added to our three existing lines. Um, Denver created a transit-oriented development fund, I believe in 2009, which was started by the city and the Enterprise Foundation, and that's now expanding to become the Mile High Transit-Oriented Development Fund. Partner nonprofit and for-profit developers can use the fund to purchase properties near existing and future rail lines, land banking if necessary, and they can rehab and uh, properties and redevelopment, redevelop sites. Um, the goal is to create housing and economic development opportunities along rail lines. So data from this project is supporting the work of the TOD Collaborative in the fund, which is funded by many local and national foundations and local governments. See if I can move the slides. Um, the Community Strategies Institute was hired by the city to expand or develop four specific data sets. For each, we gathered data for the entire seven county Metro Denver area and then created sub data sets of properties that are either within a half mile ring around existing and future rail stations or within a quarter mile of a high frequency bus route um, with buses that travel every 15 minutes along those routes. The first is the Restricted Rental Properties data set. Um, CSI created an inventory of restricted rental properties for the City of Denver in 2005, and so as part of this project, that data set was updated and it was expanded to include restricted properties in our entire seven-county metro Denver area. Uh, the second is a Restricted Owner-Occupied data set, and again, we updated an existing database that the City of Denver had of inclusionary housing units, and also added other permanently restricted and long-term restricted units in the Southern County area. Um, the third data set is of affordable market rate units that are for sale. We developed a Southern County point-in-time inventory of units that were on the market on one given day, which were affordable at 100% of the area median income in their county. And then finally, the fourth data set that we created as part of this project is a data set of unrestricted, affordable, multi-unit properties throughout the metro area. And we identified all non-owner-occupied properties that have four or more units and are not restricted. Um, our project is pretty new, and it was completed in the fall of 2010. Uh, we thought we'd give you a bit of background about how we created each of the data sets. The first, uh, the restricted rentals, um, we collected information from metro area cities and counties 
our State Housing Finance Authority, Regional HUD and Rural Development Offices, all local housing authority, and all local nonprofit housing agencies. Um, and data that we collected included the addresses of properties, information about the owners, whether they were nonprofit, for profit, contact information. Uh, we asked for the total number of units in the property, the total number of restricted units in the property, and whether the property served any special population. Uh, we collected information about the number of units by bedroom size and AMI targets, um, tried to establish the very last end restriction date, and then also cataloged the agencies that funded each property. And the information that we collected from all the different sources was combined into one record for each property. We then GIS coded all of the properties and developed a subset of those near transit. Our second data set, the permanently restricted owner-occupied units data set, was created um, using the uh, information we got from the City of Denver on their inclusionary housing and other units, uh, Habitat for Humanity uh, inventory throughout the metro area, and units that were funded by other governments and nonprofit agencies that are permanently affordable, including any land bank properties. Um, what's not included in this data set is owner-restricted properties where the owner might have gotten an affordable mortgage product or down payment assistance loans. Since those aren't necessarily tracked by the property and if that owner sold, the property would leave the affordable inventory. Again, we combined all the data, GIS coded it, and uh, created a subset of properties near transit. The third data set that we created was of affordable unrestricted units for sale. And like I said, this was sort of a point uh, to look at you know, a snapshot of where affordable properties are in the metro area that are for sale. I'm sorry, my, hopefully you can hear me. Someone's trying to call my phone line. Um, first, we determined 100% AMI, affordable price point, in each county for both attached and detached products for our median household size. And then we um, were able to download records from our multi-list service um, of properties that were at those price points, GIS code them, and create, again, a transit subset. The fourth and um, really the most complicated and time-consuming data set that we created was of unrestricted affordable rental, affordable rental properties throughout the metro area. And to create this data set, we first contacted the tax assessor office in each county and asked for the records for properties with four or more units that weren't owner-occupied. Um, we then geocoded all the records and determined which properties were near transit. And this is the only data set where we only went further with those properties that were near transit. As you can see on this slide, we identified 5,300 properties that met that criteria and the this, this data set was so large, we weren't going to look at other areas except those near transit. Um, we then used our geocoding to determine where properties lay within 30 sub-markets throughout Metro Denver. And in, um, in our area, we're very lucky that we have something called the Metro Denver Rent and Vacancy Survey that's been being conducted, I think, since the 1980s um, that tracks average rents, uh, vacancies, rents by property size, unit square footage, age, um, within these 30 submarkets. It doesn't identify individual properties, but it does identify rent and vacancy trends by different factors in each of the submarkets. We also have another survey called the Apartment Insights Survey, and this survey um, tracks multifamily properties with 50 or more units. Um, and tracks their rents, and we were able to pinpoint those properties uh, specifically, which was very helpful as we looked at trends. Um, what we found was that there was a, a lot of discrepancy between the different counties and the data that we collected, but that we were able to um, use data on property geography, age, and the size of the property, meaning how many units are in the total property to estimate rents at each. Um, and so we used our different surveys, looked at trends, looked at variations between sub-markets, 
and came up with an estimated rent at each property. We then determined which properties had rents that were below a two-bedroom 50% AMI and a two-bedroom 60% AMI rent um, to determine which ones are affordable. And um, users of our final data set have been able to use it to look at specific areas of town and find those that are affordable without restrictions at 50% and 60% AMI. Um, they can also, because we did estimate a rent at each property, choose to uh, sort the database for 40%, 30% AMI, or, or what other um, income level they might like. Some of the future refinements that we're hoping can happen with this data set are um, conducting a rent survey of these specific 5,300 properties um, to further refine our data and determine exact rents at the properties, and then also identify those that are most in danger of being lost to the affordable inventory. And that's the background of our, our project. Tracy? Great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, if anyone has any specific questions for Jenny at this point, um, feel free to raise your hand or, or send them in a chat. Uh, I believe now we have um, Vincent on the line. Vincent, can we hear you now? Uh, I hope so. We can. And I'm going to go. try to find your correct slide here. Here you go. And so you, Vincent, should have um, control now. Great. All right. Thanks so much. Sorry about that before. Um, so I'm Vincent Reyna. I am um, at the Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy. We're uh, Research Center based out of NYU, or a joint center between the uh, Law School and the Wagner School of Public Service. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, our subsidized housing information project. I see by the uh, names on the, the dial-in that uh, there's a bunch of people who have, who have helped us throughout this process and are our partners on this, so I'm excited to see you there and also to explain this to some people who haven't heard about it yet. So just in brief, the um, a little bit of the history of the ship. Um, you know, in 2005, this dates back to 2005 when uh, New York City's Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development um, was aggressively trying, I mean, they've always been aggressively trying, but particularly then were aggressively trying to, uh, to assess what was going on in the affordable housing portfolio in New York City, particularly around the currently subsidized properties uh, that were, uh, for the first time, facing the opportunity to opt out of their affordability programs. Um, and when they started going through this process, they realized that data was, um, you know, all over um, one agency, no less multiple agencies, and this is a testament to naturally how complex these deals are and the multiple layers of subsidy that are found on them. Um, so at the time, the city, uh, with the help of the MacArthur Foundation, hired APT Associates to come in and do a survey of what was going on in New York City, and one of the recommendations that APT made was to have a neutral party, an honest broker, um, to essentially create a database of the expiring properties in New York City. Uh, that resulted in an RFP and then us working in conjunction with New York City's Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development to develop our subsidized housing information project. Um, so, briefly, what is SHIP? Uh, first, it, uh, one of its goals is to develop a publicly accessible database of the privately owned government subsidized properties in New York City. Um, another goal of ours is to produce an annual report that analyzes properties that have received these subsidies. Uh, and then another was, as naturally as a research center, we were interested in the research we can do from this information. Uh, so right here I show you two kind of immediate research projects we, uh, we, we stated from the get-go, which is which prop identifying which properties are likely to opt out going forward and looking at what happens to tenants after a property opts out. So a little bit about the database. It's a one-stop source for extensive information on three distinct portfolios. Anything that has received HUD financing, um, anything that received financing through the low-income housing tax credit program or through uh, the New York State-specific uh, Mitchell-Lama program. Uh, this is primarily a rental database. Um, so these three portfolios combined, uh, we found that there were um, over 233,000 units of housing and properties that received financing from these programs. Um, and what we did is naturally we cataloged what was ever developed and uh, in addition what still remains in those programs. And so immediately we found that about 27% of these units are no longer financed through any of these subsidy programs. 
Um, in order to get to these numbers, we pulled together over 50 distinct data sets uh, from our local partners and from uh, the HUD national data sets. Uh, and we augmented this with uh, extensive local information uh, from various city, public city websites, some proprietary data, um, and we even went through and combed through various legal documents, uh, not only on the web, but also in the uh, filing cabinets of our agency partners to pull out restrictive covenants that extend the affordability restrictions uh, on these properties to really identify what is the end of the affordability restriction on each property. So users can access this database through uh, what we like to think is an easy to use web based tool um, which you can find on the Furman Center website and I'll show you in the later portion a little more about the ways it has and can be used. Um, this project really was a distinct partnership between all the government agencies in New York City and state uh, dealing with housing as well as the affordable housing community uh, and people interested in affordable housing. Um, so what can you do with the SHIP uh, briefly? It really allows you to look at individual properties uh, and see uh, 43 distinct variables ranging from um, building information such as its address to subsidy information such as start and end dates to even some physical and financial information uh, like its REAC scores or uh, code violations or water sewer liens that may be on the properties. Um, you can also view neighborhood information. We combine the housing data sets with our neighborhood data sets that we've been collecting for years. Um, and you can view over 360 neighborhood characteristics and view that on their own or in the context of those properties too. Um, you can create tables that allows you to look at that information and then naturally maps that allow you to interact with all of those components. We've also created some resources to help make this information uh, a little more uh, user-friendly. Um, in the process of going through this, we realized that there were uh, a lot of programs that have been used very effectively and creatively to finance and preserve affordable housing over the years, uh, many of which had distinct acronyms, uh, which uh, most of which we, we quite frankly had never even heard of. So we decided to create a catalog. Uh, and so on the same website, you can go and view 150 programs that have been created to finance the development of affordable housing in New York City, and you can uh, see which agencies they go through, which uh, income bands they, uh, they target, uh, whether they're actively still financing uh, new development or whether they're not. So we think that's a nice compliment to people who are using the site. And we also just generally tried to create other website tools um, like the acronyms and uh, a tutorial. And we're in the process of creating preset uh, maps and tables with kind of the main overview. Uh, so overall, this tool um, really brings together an immense portfolio of subsidized rental properties in New York City and allows people for the first time to look at uh, with all of these subsidy layers you know, in consideration, how many units have actually been developed, uh, how many still remain in those affordability programs, and how many are likely or, uh, or at least able to um, leave their affordability restrictions going forward. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, turn it back to Tracy. Great. Thank you, Vincent. So I have um, a, a couple, just a couple quick questions and then we'll move to round two. Um, it, it sounds to me like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the um, Furman Center's database is online and live and folks can view it now, correct? Yes. And then um, just to go around, uh, uh, Anne and Jenny, you're both unmuted now. Um, the Schimberg Center's database, um, Anne, online and live and accessible? Yes, yeah, our assisted housing inventory, which is analogous to the to the firm and ship database, and then the lost pr properties inventory, both are. Okay. And then um, Jenny. In uh, yeah, the Denver databases are not online. Okay. They're so they're being used by the TOD Collaborative, and I'm not sure that there really is a plan to share them online. Sure. Okay. So for the for the um, New York and the Florida databases, we'll be sure to get out the links to those um, to those websites. We'll show them, but we'll also be sure to to um, to email them out. So, um, unless anyone has um, any questions for folks on round one, we will move um, to round two. So we'll go into um, specifics on 
um, applications and accomplishments um, for each uh, model. And we're going to start with um, Andres Blanco from uh, the Schimberg Center. And again, feel free to submit um, questions or raise your hand while he's, um, while he's talking. I'm trying to find the right, here we go. So um, Andres, you are, you are on. Okay, thank you. So um, for the lost properties inventory, we have a um, um, couple of uh, research projects going on. And uh, what I'm going to show here today is one of those, and I'm going to um, uh, share some um, initial uh, results. So um, in a sense, um, the type of questions that we are trying to answer is what happens with um, the, these properties uh, after they leave the assisted housing inventory? And what are the factors that are related to these trajectories? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit more about the trajectories in, in, in the next slide. Um, but for now, it's just um, um, to present the questions, and, and we feel that this is very important for preservation purposes and risk assessment if we can really understand what is going on with these uh, lost properties, uh, um, um, with this lost property inventory. So uh, trajectories for, the, for a given property, uh, we have um, two levels uh, of trajectory. The property can stay in the rental housing, the property can be converted to condo, or the, por or the property can be demolished or stay vacant. For those properties, and this is level two, that stay in the rental housing, we can have uh, a properties that stay affordable uh, in the same like affordability levels that they had before. Some properties can be mixed. That means that some units are affordable, but some units uh, have become unaffordable. And some properties are uh, just uh, the 100% uh, of units have become unaffordable. So we are trying to understand uh, what determine each one of these uh, trajectories um, um, of the lost property inventory. So the data that we have is a, a survey that the Schimber Center conducted with at least uh, like more than 50% uh, of the uh, lost properties. It, this slide I'm, I'm showing there the numbers. And, and um, as part of that survey, uh, we ask questions about the um, uh, current rents, and we, we compare that with the affordability restrictions that would be in place uh, if the property had not left the assisted housing inventory to estimate if the property is still affordable or not. So with that information, we run uh, some models using econometrics. Um, like uh, multinomial uh, logic models to estimate, the idea here is to estimate the uh, probability of a given property to stay rental or to be converted to condo or to be demolished. And for those that stay rental, the probability of stay affordable or be mixed or become unaffordable. And we uh, um, test different uh, variables related to property, neighborhood, county, uh, uh, level uh, accessibility conditions to see what factors are related to this uh, um, to this trajectory. So some results, for example, here in this slide, uh, we can see uh, when all other things are equal and we only take into account the number of total units, what happens with uh, the first uh, level of um, trajectory. So in, in in the graph, we can see like. Um, that's as the, like in the y-axis, we have probability. X-axis, we have uh, the number of housing units. So as the number of housing units increases, the probability to remain rental increases. So pretty much, if you see here in 600 uh, uh, property with 600 units, pretty much is, has a 100% probability to remain rental. Um, and we do that for a bunch of variables here. I'm only showing uh, some of those. All of these variables that I'm showing here uh, were um, uh, significant. Um, so for example, in this second uh, case, we have when all other things are equal, uh, and as the number of years after loss increases, the probability to remain rental decreases. Um, this uh, third example is very interesting because we can see here um, what happens uh, when, the, um, when the market is, is, is going well and the, and the uh, um, rent in the neighborhood is increasing. 
So essentially, when the uh, rent in the neighborhood is increasing, the probability to um, remain rental decreases, and then the probability to convert it to condo increases, but only up to a point. After that, the probability of demolition increases. And we have been like researching what is going on with these properties, and we see that essentially these properties are demolished because the market is very hot and, and, and they are building uh, high rises or other uh, uh, like uh, type of, of, of buildings instead of the, of the um, property that was uh, in the assisted housing inventory. Uh, in the fourth case, We can see, for example, how the distance to the uh, central business district or the, the, the center of the city affects the probability to remain rental or go condo. So essentially, the probability to remain rental increases as, as uh, we move farther away from the uh, CBD. So essentially, those properties that are more centrally located have a higher probability to be converted to condo. So all these uh, uh, variables and all these uh, um, a relationship between variables uh, and, and how they determine the probability of these, pro, uh, these uh, um, trajectories are very important to understand what can we do in terms of, um, in terms of preservation. Uh, I don't know if I have time to show more, more examples. Sure, why don't, you, why don't you finish up? I think you just have a couple more, right? Okay, yeah, I have uh, four more examples. So okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over this one here. Is more interesting. So this one is uh, is in the second model, and it's essentially showing uh, what happens uh, with uh, with the probability of uh, stay affordable or become unaffordable or mixed um, according to the uh, um, income restriction that was in place when the property was in the assisted housing inventory. So essentially, what this is showing is as as the income restriction becomes less stringent, we are talking about more than 60 or 80 percent of the um, AMI, the probability to remain um, affordable increases here. You can see it here in the, in, the, in, the, in the final part of the curve. But those properties that had the most stringent uh, restrictions, uh, 30 uh, percent of the AMI, for example, the probability of those to become unaffordable is pretty much 100%. Uh, you can see that in the initial part of the curve. Um, here in this example, we can see pretty much uh, like uh, uh, the same thing that uh, I was um, like explaining before. We, with very hot markets, we have uh, that the probability of uh, being mixed increases and when the market, uh, when the rent is very high in the neighborhood, then of course the probability of unaffordability increases. Uh, the final example that I have is uh, um, is showing that I have here in, in, in this presentation. We can I, I can show you more examples if you are interested. Um, um, it's bus connectivity. So essentially, uh, as bus connectivity increases, the probability to remain affordable decreases. This shows that bus connectivity is important and it's attractive for higher segments of, of the demand. Um, so that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. I have um, just a couple of quick questions, I think. Um, the first one is what years um, were included in, in your study? So we are including properties that um, that uh, left the inventory after 2000, okay. from 2000 to 2009. Yeah. Great. And then there was a question submitted um, about who, do you have a sense of who the main users are of um, the lost property inventories, inventory? No, in, in reality, we, we, in, this, in this specific research, we are not uh, um, like having uh, information about that, but I'm not sure if uh, Anne in, 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 in the other research for, uh, from the Chamber. Well, I've, you know, I've, where I've seen it used is, I mean, in addition to it being available on our website, so if somebody is interested in their specific area, I've seen it used in advocacy, for instance, you know, one of our legal assistance attorneys who's active in the Tampa Bay area being able to say this is what we've lost in our community and this is how many units we have compared to what we have now. And uh, again, mm -hmm. I think it's a powerful tool for showing that as we take steps forward to add inventory, we are taking some te steps back when we lose it. 
Yeah, great. Okay, um, anyone else who has questions, continue to submit and we'll, we'll try to get to them. Um, next up, uh, we'll go to Vincent uh, from the Furman Center and um, see if we can get your slide up. It's all yours, Vincent. Cool. All right, so my goal here is to just highlight some ways that CHIP has been used. So um, we, like I said before, we developed a report that analyzed all of these properties um, and kind of trends over time, and that's all accessible on our website. Um, and uh, one thing we also did was highlight properties with subsidy restrictions uh, likely to expire in the near future, so I just kind of gave some examples here. Uh, so you can see the 227 properties with uh, over 38,000 units will be eligible to exit all of the ship affordability restrictions in the next five years. So that's looking at all of the subsidy layering on top of each other. Um, 26 Michelama rental properties uh, with 7,700 units are currently eligible to opt out, but have not done so. We're in the process right now of doing a study that looks at all the Michelama properties that have opted out and uh, the characteristics of those properties and trying to do a regression model to basically predict which properties are likely to opt out going forward. Um, and then naturally, there are no low-income housing tax credit properties eligible to leave their affordability restrictions in the next five years because of uh, all of them having 30-year affordability restrictions. But 332 uh, of the 1,500 properties will reach year 15 by 2015 uh, and may need some form of recapitalization. Um, so now I just wanted to show you quickly a couple of things uh, you can do on the site that um, you might find useful. So first, um, in looking at the properties expiring going forward, when you're on our site, uh, you can create tables like I said before, and here I created a table of all of the properties that have financing from uh, RAP and rents up that are currently affordable and are due to uh, their contracts are ending uh, between 2012 and 2016. Um, so what you can see is, you know, the number of properties per year, the number of buildings, and the total number of units. So this is a way that some people have used our site thus far, just to get a scale of how many properties are expiring um, and then look specifically at the subsidies on them. If you wanted to delve into a specific property, which is another way that people have used the site, what you can do is you can actually download a full property report that gives you all of the information about the geography, the building itself, um, you can see there's violations uh, right there, A, B, and C violations. This building has none. Um, and at the bottom, you can see the... Vincent, I'm sorry. This is, this is Tracy. We're not seeing your window being shared. Oh, okay. That's so unfortunate. If you can hit share applications again, I think it should come back up. Oh, okay. Um, I'll so go back to the green button. Let's see if we can get this done quickly. Did that work? There we go. There we go. Okay, great. So here what you can see is a detailed property report, um, like I said, of a property and you go through, you can see that there is no viol A, B, or C violations. At the bottom you can see the subsidies that are on it um, and which ones are still active. So it's still in the Michelama program, still has a mortgage through New York City's Housing Development Corporation, um, but it no longer has uh, its uh, 223F uh, mortgage insurance through HUD. That expired in 2006. So it shows you that, you know, if you just looked at the HUD insurance on its own, you might assume that this property, um, you might have left all subsidy programs, but you can see that it's still in the Mitchell-Alma program uh, and has an HDC mortgage. Um, another way the site has been used is we get a lot of requests from um, people wanting to know about specific geographic areas. Uh, so, for instance, we're working closely with the city council. Uh, they provided us funding to do trainings, and we've done one training to um, a bunch of tenant organizers, and we have one coming up to actually tenant leaders in these properties. But here you see a map of the uh, properties that are cataloged and shipped that are in city council district number 37 in Brooklyn, which is uh, city council member Delon's uh, district. He's the, the head of the housing committee, and, you know, he might want to know what's... Um, how many properties are affordable in his district. Um, oftentimes people then want to look at uh, some neighborhood characteristics on top of that. So here you can see these same properties, uh, but you can also see the median rent burden uh, broken down by sub-borough area, and you can see that that uh, city council district has a rent burden, uh, median rent burden of 32 to 35 percent. So it allows you to look at, you know, properties and then within that neighborhood information context, 
naturally then you can go within a given property, click on any of these bubbles, and view all of that information I talked about uh, before. Um, one last thing, you can see our website up top, datasearch.fermancenter.org. Uh, when you go here, um, we encourage you to go there and just explore around the site. We have a feedback button at the bottom, and we're always open to hearing people's suggestions, not only about the site itself, but about other pieces of information that could be useful. Um, so I'm just going to wrap it up there. Those are just some of the ways it has been used and can be used, uh, but we would like to think that this, this website uh, you know, and its future applications will hopefully be limitless. Uh, so Great, Vincent. Thank you. So you need to stop sharing. There you go. All right. Um, thanks. That's really interesting and, and, um, and cool to see. Um, and unless anyone submits questions, um, or we can come back to those questions. We're going to go to a new voice on the webinar. Um, Brad Weinig is from Enterprise, and he's going to complete um, this round with some applications from uh, Denver. It's all yours, Brad. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Uh, as, as Tracy said, my name is Brad Weinig. I am the Transit Oriented Development Program Director at Enterprise Community Partners. Uh, we're a national nonprofit organization focusing on kind of all things surrounding affordable housing. Uh, my work in particular is focused largely in the Denver area <coughs> and uh, transit specific. And, and CSI's housing inventory is an important part of, of what my colleagues and I in Denver are, are currently undertaking. Um, I'll do my best to quickly summarize three examples of how we are utilizing CSI's inventory work. Um, here in Denver, a little over a year ago, a group of nonprofits, foundations, and banks formed uh, what we're calling the Mile High Transit Opportunity Collaborative with the goal of kind of combining all of our resources and expertise to ensure that as Denver builds out its, its multi-billion dollar transit system over the next decade or so, that historically disadvantaged communities, low-income, minority, senior, disabled, etc., cetera, um, enjoy increased access to opportunities to a higher quality of life. And so housing is is of course a big part of that, but it also stretches to um, jobs, to um, affordable transportation, to quality schools, healthcare, um, exercise, etc. Um, a major part of our early work is, is, is a work in progress that we're referring to as the Opportunity Atlas. It's a visual representation of many of the inequities that we know to exist in our region, kind of all overlaid with the planned transit system map. Um, ultimately, it, it will serve as a publicly available a uh, case-making document that, we can, that can be utilized um, to kind of advocate with elected officials, with funders, with other potential partners, and it will also serve as a, a baseline against which to measure our impact moving forward. Um, you can see that there are several topic areas within the Atlas um, and, and data from a multitude of sources, including CSI. Here's one example of the 30 or so maps that will be included in the Atlas, and one of a handful that utilizes the information from Ginny and Tom's database. I know it's a little hard to read uh, due to the layout, but what it shows is that the location of affordable housing units in relation to the existing and planned light rail, commuter rail, and high frequency bus lines in the Denver metro area. The red dots indicate where deed restricted for sale units exist, uh, the green dots where deed restricted rental units exist, and the blue dots indicate rental units that are not deed restricted but are inherently affordable uh, to its tenants likely due to a combination of location, age, and condition of the property. As you can see from this map, a lot of these units exist in the entering suburbs surrounding kind of downtown CBD, Denver, particularly to the east, southwest, and northwest. And these are areas that currently do not enjoy great access to public transportation, but um, hope to, during our expansion, serve these populations um, increasingly as we move forward. Another example of how we're using the housing inventory is as a part of the decision tool that we are using. Um, for our $15 million uh, acquisition loan facility that we're calling the TOD Fund. The TOD Fund, as Jenny mentioned, was created to provide beneficial financing to enable the acquisition of properties in close proximity to public transit in advance of market speculation uh, to preserve it for affordable housing and other community benefit uses. This tool, uh, like the Atlas, combines multiple sources of data that will help us in strategically targeting various submarkets and transit corridors in the region. This particular map shows a future light rail corridor in Aurora, east of Denver. The dark maroon areas surrounding those five stations in the middle indicate where there are high concentrations of households earning less than $25,000 per year. And the various shades of blue are taken from Tom and Jenny's study 
to display median rents for various submarket areas. And you can see, along with a high concentration of low-income households, that there are relatively low median rental rates. This tells us that there are likely opportunities to preserve affordable housing in this area before market forces push many of these households further away from transit access. And then the orange parcels uh, from the assessor's data represent where there are existing multifamily parcels with rather low per unit values, indicating where we might begin our search for um, advantageous acquisitions and properties to acquire moving forward. And finally, a third example of um, what we're using is kind of the initial intended use from the city of Denver, the early warning system, um, which will help the city and, and, and the region monitor kind of where there are properties that may be at risk of losing their affordable nature. So we're, we're a bit behind New York and Florida, and I'm inspired by their work, and hopefully we can get to a point where we have something very similar to them. Um, obviously, the most efficient way to ensure that uh, there are as, much, as many affordable units as possible well located in the near transit access or to make sure that all the existing units um, that are already meeting that need uh, remain affordable for the long term. We created this map to show the location of, of all affordable multifamily properties, both restricted and otherwise, with at least 70 units. So our ultimate goal is to, is to seek preservation through private capital and, and leverage resources. Our thinking is that private developers, investors, and lenders will likely be more interested in, in some of the larger properties that can provide some economies of scale. So we just kind of used 70 units as a, as a test. We can obviously modify that number. And we can then share this information and property level detail with our affordable housing developer partners, uh, both nonprofit and for-profit, and help them target properties for acquisition and potential rehabilitation or redevelopment using tax credits or taxes and bonds or other, other financing sources. Um, I hope that didn't take too long or, or confuse somebody too much. It's kind of a, a whole lot of things that are still underway. Uh, I'd be happy to try to answer questions later if we, if we have time, but I'll, I'll give it back to Tracy at this point. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. Um, keep, keep sending um, questions if anyone has them. We'll, uh, we'll come back around, uh, we'll come back around to, to some questions at the end. Uh, we're going to move right to our final round here. Um, and some of our presenters have already um, addressed the question about how these models or are applicable to other localities um, and if there's a way to adapt these approaches on a wider scale. So we'll just do a quick um, round robin um, around the table, around the phones, um, to see if anyone has anything to add to what, um, to what they already said about um, how these approaches might be adapted on a on a wider scale. So, um, Anne, Andres, over at Schimberg. I think the one thing I would mention is just as you know, we've seen that these inventories of existing affordable housing can be replicated in other places. I, I think the lost properties inventory model can be replicated as well, and it looks like that's integrated already into into the Furman Center's model, which is great. Um, so we're interested in expanding this study of what happens post subsidy to other places as well. Uh, the survey we've been doing, now we're in our third year of rents, is something that I think could easily be expanded to other places. So I'd love to get in touch with folks who would be interested in expanding that into their areas as well and doing that same kind of follow-up in other states. Great. Um, Vincent, anything, anything on this from uh, the Furman Center? We can't hear you, Vincent, if you're speaking. Oh, we'll come there we go. Oh, there we go. All right, there's, a, there's also a great uh, network already of people working and doing this. So um, I think uh, anyone who is excited by what they see here between Schimberg, us, uh, Colorado, and I mean CDAC uh, up in Boston and various other groups are doing really awesome work in this area. Yep, great. And um, Brad, Tom, Jenny, um, I think there's one more um, slide from um, Community Strategies Institute. Um, do you guys want to describe what you were talking about in this slide? Yeah, I just put together a slide, uh, real brief ideas. You know, I think we got very excited putting these four uh, data sets together for Denver, thinking about how this could be applicable to other areas. Um, certainly, like Brad talked about, the Opportunity Index is something that can be put together in any area. Um, planning for change, using this type of data, 
especially looking at your restricted inventory, and as everybody here has talked about, you know, the, the possibility of restricted inventory um, losing its subsidy, and then the unrestricted affordable inventory, when you're planning for change from not only transit, but um, other redevelopment efforts, including, you know, the new job centers, um, downtown redevelopment, whatever it might be, you can really use data like this for, for your planning. Um, and then the other thing that we've talked a lot about amongst people here is the fact that um, especially our unrestricted affordable rental data set, data sets like that can be used by housing providers um, to strategically look at acquisitions and redevelopment efforts. So I, I think those are some of the ideas and, and certainly um, uh, myself and Tom Hart would love to talk to anybody who is interested in doing this in their community. Thanks. Great. And I think, Jenny, you're, you're and Anne, Anne said it, and um, I think Vincent implied it, that anyone that's interested in, in um, going deeper on this should um, either get directly in touch with um, the folks who have presented on this call or, or get in touch with me, and I'll put you in touch with um, the right people. There's a lot of um, exciting work going on around the country. Um, not just with the folks that are on this call, but um, with a, a lot of other a lot of other organizations that are doing um, really exciting work. So um, be in touch with me, and I can get you in touch with um, with the right people. Um, if anyone, I, I think I've I've knocked off most of the questions that have been submitted. Um, if anyone has any questions um, for uh, on anything that's been discussed today, feel free to submit it now. Um, and I can, I can either get to the question now or I will do my best to um, get an answer and get back to you um, after the webinar is over. Um, we are recording this webinar, so um, we will post, I will send out a link and then we will post a link also on our um, website, on the National Housing Trust website, um, so that if you want to go back and look at anything in greater detail that was um, discussed here or, or have somebody else you know take a look at it, it will be, um, we'll, we'll send that out so it's all recorded. I don't see any final questions coming in, so um, I want to wrap up real quickly and give you guys 20 minutes of your life that you didn't think you were going to have back here. Um, we're going to finish a little early here. Um, one quick request to the MacArthur grantees who are on the line. Um, if you haven't har already done so, um, I would greatly, greatly appreciate if you completed the survey that you should have received um, a couple weeks ago, I think on January 9th. Um, any and all feedback we receive um, is helpful. So um, if you have any thoughts on that, please take a look um, and, and um, send that survey back. Um, I think that that's it. So I thank you. I thank our presenters so much for their time and all their great work, and the rest of you for sharing your valuable time with us. Um, as always, feel free to contact me with any questions, ideas for future webinars, or um, comments. Thanks, everyone. Happy New Year. Thank you. Please stand by.